Hello, ladies and gentlemen. In this lecture, we're going to uh, discuss some special areas of anesthesia in which the anesthesiologist must adapt to complex surgery or complex medical conditions uh, in their patients or to just uh, unusual situations as far as patients are concerned. We're going to talk about considerations for pediatric care because children are different from adults. We're going to talk about how to deal with thoracic anesthesia and thoracic surgery, which is a very complex and potentially quite dangerous area of anesthesia. We're going to talk about cardiac anesthesia and how we deal with open, in open heart surgery. And we're going to talk very briefly about neuroanesthesia and the different types of anesthetic that may be necessary to help patients through the sometimes extraordinarily long operations. So we're going to start with children. And if you think children are just little adults, let me tell you, you're wrong. They are very much different, from an anesthetic perspective anyway, than adults. The anatomy is different, the difficulties involved in managing them are very different, and there's some risks associated with pediatric anesthesia that are not really associated with adult anesthesia. The first thing that's critical to understand is that the pediatric airway is quite different from the adult airway. And I can tell you, as I'm an adult anesthesiologist, that one of the things I dread is having to intubate a child, particularly a child under two years of age. And the reason for that is that they are obligate nasal breathers, so you can't depend upon them maintaining their airway if you plug up their nose. They can't. They cannot breathe through their mouths when they're very small. They have proportionally a much larger tongue than adults. They have proportionally a much larger occiput, so it's difficult to extend the head uh, to the same degree as it is in adults. The larynx and trachea are funnel-shaped with the uh, narrowest point in the airway being at the cricoid, whereas in adults it's at the glottis, at the opening of the uh, glottis. The vocal cords are on a funny angle in children, and it's hard for me to even describe it because all I can tell you is that they're hard to find, they're hard to see, and unless you're very used to doing children, it's very challenging. The larynx is higher in the neck than it is in adults. It's at the C4 level instead of the C6 level. As I already mentioned, the narrowest part of the pediatric airway is at the cricoid. So when you go through the cords in a child, you haven't hit the narrowest portion of the airway. That comes next. And whereas in adults, the narrowest point is at the cords. So any tube that'll go comfortably through the cords is going to be fine. Whereas in children, comfortably through the cords may still mean stuck at the cricoid. The cricoid cartilage position in the child changes at uh, different times of life. Uh, and uh, the narrow point remains the narrowest point at the cricoid until age four to five. Uh, and then in uh, adults, uh, uh, the uh, glottis increasingly becomes the critical uh, uh, stricture point. The glottic opening, the opening of the uh, larynx, is, changes positions over uh, childhood life. Uh, so that it's quite high in the, th in the throat uh, and in the premature babies. It's at an intermediate area in, uh, uh, in uh, toddlers and newborns, and then it's much lower in adults. This diagram shows you the epiglottis. The epiglottis is much more curved in a child than in an adult. It's much stiffer than in an adult, and it's harder to move. And you can see it's harder to see the cords. The cords are kind of off in the distant and uh, not as easy to identify as they were in our earlier pictures of adult airways. These are the supplies that you need, the basic supplies you need uh, to secure the pediatric airway. And the first thing you should notice is that none of these endotracheal tubes have a cuff on them. These tubes are made to fit at the cricoid level reasonably snugly so that there's no leak. You don't want to inflate a cuff uh, at that level because the pressure on the cricoid can damage the uh, laryngeal mucosa and actually lead to the development of tracheal stenosis. So these tubes are not cuffed like they are in an adult. And you can see the various sizes from quite small to somewhat larger. 
And at the very bottom, uh, you see a tube that's a rather funny shaped tube. It's got about a 30 degree angle in it and the distal part of the tube is small and there's kind of a, um, a ridge about two thirds of the way down the tube. That ridge goes right at the incisor teeth in a newborn and the distal part of the tube goes down through the cords and it's supposed to help the tube stabilize. I, it doesn't very well so you still have to tape it in or secure it in some way but that was the original thought when it was developed. These are typical pediatric laryngoscopes and you'll notice that even the biggest of these which would be used in a probably in a child up to about eight or nine years of age is not as curved as the Macintosh blade that's used in adults. And the other blades, many of the blades are straight blades. The Miller blade, the straight blade, is much more commonly used in children than in adults because that epiglottis is so stiff and difficult to deal with, you actually try to put the blade under the epiglottis and lift the epiglottis. Whereas in adults, you put it in front of the epiglottis uh, uh, and, and lift the tongue, and it's the tongue that lifts the epiglottis. That doesn't happen predictably in small children. So here's a child being intubated, the usual uh, mask and bag and masking at the beginning. You can see that the laryngoscope handle is much smaller than in an adult. That's just to make it easier to manage and balance it better. Uh, and the anesthesiologist is passing a tube. Uh, the tube is at the point that the anesthesiologist is happy with in the fourth picture and they will secure the tube at that point and then take over the child's breathing for them. So other considerations in pediatric anesthesia include temperature regulation. Children lose heat much more rapidly than adults and small children have trouble uh, producing heat. They actually, newborns, have something called brown fat which is used to generate heat, where heat is generated in the rest of us and in older people by muscle activity. So it's hard to regulate temperature in children, but it's very critical that it, that it is regulated because they do very poorly if they're hypothermic. So if you ever have to work in a uh, pediatric operating room, you'll be surprised how hot it is, how warm it is. It's quite honestly not very comfortable and I'm glad I work in an adult operating room where we all freeze, but uh, it is very warm in the uh, pediatric ORs to prevent heat loss. Drug management is much more critical. Uh, children uh, dosing is totally different from adult dosing and much to many people's surprise, the actual uh, dose of induction drug and maintenance drug required by children is proportionally much greater than that in adults. So very small children will eat quite large doses and then as they get older the proportional dose actually decreases. Other drugs however are totally unpredictable and you have to dose your drugs according to the child's weight or body surface area. You cannot just guesstimate how much you're going to give. Fluid management in children is difficult because it's extremely easy to overload a child and put them into heart failure. So you have to be skilled at this. You have to know what you're doing. Uh, and you have to pick your IV solutions and blood products very carefully. So instead of giving a unit of blood, you might only give 30 cc's of blood uh, or 60 cc's of blood. Uh, and you might give it uh, slowly uh, and very carefully and heated before you deliver it. Uh, in a total different way than we do it with adults. Children often develop laryngospasm when recovering and laryngospasm is a uh, spasm of the muscles in the larynx and in the trachea and this can cause complete obstruction of the airway. This is particularly likely to occur if you manipulate the tube when the patient's just starting to wake up, when they're still lightly anesthetized they haven't fully recovered. If you manipulate the tube at that time, it can set off a reflex that makes it very difficult to ventilate the child. It's much better to wait until the child is completely awake before you take the tube out. If they do develop uh, uh, laryngospasm, they tend to desaturate very quickly because their lung capacity is very small and their oxygen demand is very high, higher than in adults. The best way to do it if they develop laryngospasm and they're desaturating is to apply CPAP 
uh, when you bag and mask. And CPAP just means that you maintain steady pressure at the end of expiration. And in most children, that'll overcome the spasm in the larynx and cause it to open and you can ventilate uh, quite adequately at that point. If it doesn't work, you have to paralyze the child and consider re-intubating. As children get a little older, needle phobia is very common. Uh, the commonest age for really severe needle phobia is in girls around 13 or 14 and in boys around 19 to about 24. So the boys, as one might expect, uh, mature a little less quickly than the girls. Pain management must be customized to the personality, size, and conditions of the, ch of the child. They sometimes need quite large amounts of pain medications and you have to adjust according to the needs of the child. Anesthesiologists who provide care to premature babies or children requiring highly sophisticated surgical procedures like cardiac surgery or neurosurgery, burn surgery, thoracic surgery, or other highly specialized areas of surgery, the anesthetists require extra training. And in my country, the average pediatric anesthesiologist working in a pediatric hospital has done an additional two years of training beyond the usual five years already required for anesthesia training. 